Welcome to Neopo Wars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, August 1st, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, while the mainstream media points to Russia being behind the DNC hack attack, NSA whistleblower William Benny says the leaks may have come from disgruntled U.S. intelligence workers who are not too happy with Hillary Clinton. Then, Pope Francis has openly promoted a one-world religion and a new world order on 12 separate occasions. Meanwhile, a priest who represents the largest religious community in Sweden says Europe needs to wake up because radical Muslim extremists have declared war on Christianity. And Angela Merkel is on the ropes as thousands of protesters hit the streets to demand the end of Germany's open-door immigration policy. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. In an interesting piece of irony, we find that the upcoming Black Hat Conference of Hackers in Las Vegas is going to have on the side a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. This is a story on Infowars.com from Kyle Phelan. He points out that a fundraiser for Democrat presidential nominee Hillary Clinton will be held this week at the prestigious Hacking Conference. According to cybersecurity journalist Steve Reagan, the fundraiser will begin on Wednesday during the evening hours of the Black Hat Conference in Vegas. Now, isn't that interesting? Because I guess it's a, an interesting case of uh, whether you want to look at this as irony or hypocrisy. Nevertheless, it is job security for these people who are there, both white hat and black hat uh, hackers at this conference. Uh, this is the presidency that is going to keep uh, cybersecurity in focus because there's been numerous leaks. And so the question is, as Hillary Clinton is moving forward, as she retains her Security clearance, unlike former CIA director John Deutsch, who her husband had to give a pardon to to keep from going to jail, and who lost his security clearance when he had a few emails on his unsecured personal laptop. Hillary Clinton, who sent and received classified emails, who exposed uh, emails that were born classified, not only retains her security clearance, but moves ahead to become president underscored by the fact, and this is another article at Infowars.com, uh, a prankster, uh, Joey Salads, goes through and illustrates the absurdity of this. He goes around and interviews for jobs, and he tells his employers as he's proceeding in the interview, and everything is going really well, he tells them, well, oh, by the way, I'm under FBI investigation. At that point, the job interviews end, but not for Hillary Clinton because there's a different standard for her. So the question is, as we look at the massive red herring move, the, the McCarthyism that we saw in reaction to the Lewis set of emails that were leaked from the DNC, pointing to Russia, was it really from Russia or was it from somewhere else? Now, Motherboard has come out and said, all signs point to Russia being part of the DNC hack. They look at things like they say, well, there's uh, fingerprints on it that look like it was typed on a Cyrillic keyboard uh, from Russia. Uh, there's other things in the metadata that look like it's coming from Russia. But, of course, uh, as part of a, uh, a Reddit question, they asked the person who said he's Guccifer 2.0, that said he's from Romania. They said, well, say something to us in Romanian, at which point he couldn't. So a lot of people have inferred from that, as Motherboard has, that all signs point to Russia being involved. Nevertheless, you have to understand that uh, we've never solved these types of uh, uh, espionage things so quickly in the past before. Whenever you see that, whenever they immediately have somebody that they finger, it's rarely the right person. It's usually part of a false flag to distract people from the real sources of this. And I have to say that even though these things were in there, that doesn't necessarily mean that it came from Russia. We have another article, as we mentioned earlier today on the radio show, uh, Breitbart had an interview with William Binney, the former technical head of the NSA. He believes that it's possibly somebody who is in the NSA or the FBI or CIA that has leaked these documents. Somebody, for example, who takes the security of America seriously, who thinks that there shouldn't be a different standard for Hillary Clinton, that she shouldn't be allowed to go free when other people would be facing multiple life sentences for what she did just 
with the security leaks. And so William Benny points out that uh, he thinks it might be a disgruntled U.S. intelligence worker who's concerned about Clinton's compromise of national security secrets via her personal email use. And he went on to point out that part of what got so many people in the intelligence community upset was that Hillary Clinton exposed information from the uh, gamma uh, compartment. He says this is essentially an NSA handling area that is applied to extraordinarily sensitive information. For example, decrypted conversations between top foreign leadership. And we pointed out many times that it wasn't just secret or confidential or even top secret. It was above top secret. It was documents that were born secret because they involved conversations and analysis of conversations that had been held. You don't need to wait until those are classified. You know that those are classified. And she set up a system to subvert that. So he believes that not only is there the possibility that uh, uh, these people who have this capability here in America could and would do that, but he even goes on to say that he believes that the NSA has all that information, as former FBI Director Robert Mueller has pointed out. The FBI was uh, keeping that information. We learned that as part of the uh, Snowden materials that were released. So clearly, that is a possibility. And clearly, if it was somebody within the American government, as I point out, it, it looks to me a great deal like Watergate 2.0, where we had uh, people that were part of the FBI being deep throat, even at the heart of the, the, the peak of the Cold War. Nobody ever suggested that the Russians were deep throat. It was part of an effort by people to try to get Richard Nixon out of the presidency. And I think a lot of people are concerned not only about the criminal actions of Hillary Clinton, but the threat that it presents to our security. So we never can tell. I mean, if we've got uh, Russian fingerprints in there, so anybody could put that type of uh, information in in order to uh, cover what they're doing. Let's take a look at what happened this weekend with Islam, with the protests against Angela Merkel. And with the statements by the Pope that Islam is a religion of peace. In contrast to that, we have a top Swedish priest say that Islamists have declared war on Christianity. This is a story on Infowars.com. This is a priest in the Swedish church, the Evangelical Lutheran National Church. It has about 6.2 million members. She wrote an op-ed, and she decried Sweden's reaction to last week's murder of a Catholic priest in France by Islamists, asking why the churches are silent on the issue. She says, the genocide of Christians and other religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East has been largely ignored for years. And she goes on to say that this priest was slaughtered like an animal. And I'll point out this. He was not only slaughtered like an animal, but it was a ritual killing. After they killed him, after they slit his throat or cut his head off, depending on which accounts you uh, give credence, credence to, they performed a ceremony there according to witnesses. And you have to understand that wherever Islam goes, it destroys the religious sites, the holy sites of other religions, and erects their own sites there. They were marking their territory. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the history of Islam in Europe and elsewhere. We've seen this happen. It happened a thousand years ago. It was going on throughout Europe. Uh, so you have to understand what this is about. But she goes on to say, his murder removes any doubt about the bloody declaration of war directed against Christianity on European soil. And that's the key. This happened while the Democrat convention was going on. And they were talking about every one of the firsts that happened, uh, about the first woman to do this, or the first minority to do that, or be elected to this position. Of course, they were typically uh, government issues as they were talking that. But there was an important first that happened that week. And they were completely silent about it, would not talk about ISIS, even as this priest was murdered as the convention began. She says, what is it you do not understand? What is it that you do not see and hear? Well, here's what they don't understand. The Pope comes out and speaks at a uh, large uh, gathering of youth, and he points out that um, it is the god of money that is responsible for this. He blames capitalism. And he blames a lack of job opportunities for terrorism, not Islam. This is what he says, according to the Wall Street Journal. They say uh, this is fundamental terrorism against humanity. In other words, ter capitalism is the real terrorism. Capitalism is the fundamental terrorism against all humanity. So while he says that capitalism is terrorism, he says that it's money and jobs will pacify people. He goes on to say that it's economic marginalization of Muslim youth in Europe 
that explains the actions of those who join extremist groups. He says they don't have work, so they turn to drugs and alcohol. To which we would ask, if this is true, what of the European youth who are going to have less job prospects as you have massive waves of uncontrolled immigration coming in and taking their economy down to third world status as well. He goes on to say that Muslims seek peace in spite of the fact that he just had one of his own priests ritually slaughtered in his own church in France by these peace seekers. He says it's not right to say that Islam is terroristic. If I speak of Islamic violence, I should speak of Catholic violence. So then he goes on to equate routine crime by people who happen to be Catholics to these ritualistic religious killings by Islamic terrorists. It's completely different. And let me say this, when we talk about martyrs, a Christian martyr is not the same as a Muslim martyr. Christian martyrs, understand that the word martyr is simply the Greek word for witness. Christians were referred to as martyrs because they were people who had witnessed things about Christ that they would not recant. Because they would not recant, they were slaughtered. And this went on through the Roman Empire as well as especially the Islamic occupations. So martyrs were people who refused to recant on what they had seen, whereas Muslim martyrs are people who kill others. Not people who were killed for their beliefs, but people who believe they need to kill. You need to understand the difference between the different uses of martyrism. That is the way Islam twists the truth. And when he talks about fundamentalism, he says, in almost all religions, there is always a small group of fundamentalists. Well, what is a fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is somebody who believes in the literal interpretation of their document, whether it's the Bible or whether it is the Quran. These people who follow the literal interpretation of the Quran are the people who believe that they need to kill, that they need to dominate. And then he says to these uh, students that he's addressing, people may judge you to be dreamers because you believe in a new humanity, one that refuses to see borders as barriers, one that can be without being self-centered or small-minded. Okay, you have to understand, Islam is not uh, broad-minded. It is very self-centered. It is a religion combined with politics. And the worst abuses that we have seen from Christianity, Protestant and Catholic, have been when you combined religion with uh, politics. That was when we saw the, uh, the capital punishment from each group against the other. It was as much a political movement as it was a religious movement. And that is one of the reasons why we have established the free exercise of religion in this country. You will not see that under Sharia law. And coming up, we have Leanne McAdoo and Margaret Howell talking about the connections to Sharia law from Mr. Khan, who spoke at the Democrat National Convention. He held up a constitution, but the man is all about Sharia law. The Pope's priorities are not Christianity. They're not peace. They're open borders. They're globalism. And like Angela Merkel, he is doubling down. But of course, Angela Merkel had a lot of protests against her this weekend in Germany. The Daily Mail reports there were thousands of German protesters who took to the streets all across the country saying she must go. There were 5,000 in Berlin alone. There were several thousand in other locations throughout Germany. And this is in response to multiple brutal attacks, four in fact, that left over 13 dead in just the last week or so. And when I looked at this, some of the signs that I saw said, uh, in German, said, uh, Queen of the Tractors, Angela Merkel, Queen of the Tractors. And I thought, what do they mean by that? So I, I looked that up and I did some uh, translations of a German magazine and I found an interesting comment on this, a, a magazine called Compact. Uh, they say it's a magazine of sovereignty. And in it, he says, Angela Merkel is the icon for millions who have now taken to Germany. And here's the key thing he says, the great people exchange has begun. You have to understand, that's what we have to realize in America as well as Western Europe. This is an exchange of people. And how is it being manufactured? He points out, it's interesting that when these refugees started coming in in mass, that all of a sudden, in front of these marching refugees, there are signs, laser printed signs, praising Angela Merkel. He said, who produced these? Or did these 
penniless refugees bring these things with them. He said quickly, you also saw it turn up on Facebook and Twitter. The chancellor was titled the compassionate mother. She was called holy. You saw signs that said, we love you in Arabic underneath. Okay, there was also a tip, he says, in the direction of the Syrian regime. The uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine was very happy that they linked her with a set of images that were criticized the tyrant Bashar Ashad. But it says it wasn't just in Damascus, it was also in Baghdad. And they had signs that said, the Iraqi people thank you, Angela Merkel. Okay, so this is all happening everywhere. And he says, if you think about it, you'll soon discover that the exorbitant increase in the number of people that were being brought into the country was not a function of any new things that were happening in these countries. There weren't any new natural disasters or any economic collapse or no new wars except in Yemen where Saudi Arabia invaded. But he said you saw this massive influx of people coming in and then you saw the reactions in Germany of the mainstream media. Uh, and as this was all happening, as Der Spiegel was welcoming the mass immigration as a kind of re-education. They said this, they said the masses are a burden, but they're also an opportunity. So it kind of reminds me of the uh, Chinese characters for crisis, danger and opportunity, right? Uh, they say they force the country to be open-minded and generous and a bit chaotic. But then this is where the connection to the tractor comes from. He references uh, a story going back a year ago. We had 71 refugees that were locked in the back of a refrigerator van and suffocated. Their decaying bodies were found by Austrian police as they were coming over the Hungarian border. And it wasn't just those people. Many other people coming in that way and they say, is this compassion? And he finishes up this way. He says, what Berthold Brecht said after the 1953 riots by the communists, he said, uh, would it not be easier for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? That's precisely what's going on. It's the great people exchange. And Mitt Romney says, we expected Hillary Clinton to be like Angela Merkel. Yes, she is. Angela Merkel with a long rap sheet. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Just four days to go before the opening ceremony of the 2016 Rio Olympics. An Olympics that is already appearing to be a perfect storm for a major terrorist event. On Sunday evening, a robot was sent into the Americana Stadium to detect a suspicious toolbox. An explosion was heard soon after the robot went in. No injuries were reported. Americana Stadium will be hosting the opening and closing ceremonies of the 2016 Olympic Games. Was this a test? Why did a toolbox have an explosive in it four days before the opening ceremonies? The globalist fingerprints are all over the entire debacle. The International Atomic Energy Agency provided high-tech radiation monitors in order to detect a dirty bomb, while the United Nations claims ISIS has a high probability of dropping a dirty bomb on the Olympics due to the weak security. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization downplayed the threat of the Zika virus in order to bring more unsuspecting Olympians and four to the potential hell pit. Sidney Levy, CEO of the Rio 2016 committee, has been on a media blitz reassuring the world that there is no threat of the Zika virus that is exploding in Rio. The winter just started in Rio. It's a proved fact. Every year we measure that, and in the winter months, there's no mosquitoes whatsoever. However, Dr. Amir Adaran, writing for the Harvard Public Health Review, says otherwise. Dr. Adaran wrote, Brazil's Zika problem is inconveniently not ending. The outbreak that began in the country's northeast has reached Rio de Janeiro, where it is flourishing. Clinical studies are also mounting that Zika infection is associated not just with the pediatric microcephaly and brain damage, but also adult conditions such as Guillain-Barre syndrome and acute disseminated encephalitis myelitis, which are debilitating and sometimes fatal. Simply put, Zika infection is more dangerous and Brazil's outbreak more extensive than scientists reckoned a short time ago, which leads to a bitter truth. The 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games must be postponed, moved, or both as a precautionary concession. Dr. Adaran goes on to mention five reasons the Games must be postponed. First, Rio de Janeiro suspected Zika 
Zika cases are the highest of any state in Brazil, 26,000, and its Zika incidence rate is the fourth worst, 157 per 100,000. And contrary to Mr. Levy, Rio has never experienced a winter with Zika before. In Rio de Janeiro, dengue cases in the first quarter of 2016 are a shocking six-fold higher than a year ago, with the startling baseline of Aedes born disease so much higher this year than last, it is far from guaranteed that the coming winter's ebb will make a safe environment for the games. Second, although Zika virus was discovered nearly 70 years ago, the viral strain that recently entered Brazil is clearly new, different, and vastly more dangerous than old Zika. Third, while Brazil's Zika inevitably will spread globally given enough time, viruses always do, it helps nobody to speed that up. In particular, it cannot possibly help when an estimated 500,000 foreign tourists flock into Rio for the games, potentially becoming infected and returning to their homes where both local Aedes mosquitoes and sexual transmission can establish new outbreaks. Fourth, when, not if, the games speed up Zika's spread, the already urgent job of inventing new technologies to stop it becomes harder. By spreading the virus faster and farther, the games steal away the very thing time that scientists and public health professionals need to build such defenses. Fifth, proceeding with the games violates what the Olympics stands for. The International Olympic Committee writes that Olympism seeks to create social responsibility and respect for universal fundamental ethical principles. But how socially responsible or ethical is it to spread disease? The globalists behind this are willing to create a worldwide epidemic as an act of controlled folly that will begin incubating in just four days on your local idiot box. John Bound for Infowars.com. I think, in a sense, it's all bullcrap. In a sense, humans really don't know how to interact with each other without having a conversation and actually just sitting down and taking a moment to talk to each other. They always feel as though, oh, no, we have to resort to this. We have to resort to that. Some people have to riot or the cops have to act out on police brutality. You don't have to act out on anything. The whole point of being in a civilization is for the matter of fact of being f***ing civil. The uh, action is uh, its a little boring right now, <laughs> so I'm assuming the things are going to get a little bit more heated as the sun goes down, and right now you just have people just pretty much standing looking at the, the Wells Fargo Center. So what are you here for today? Um, honestly, I'm just here because I just, I don't like the way my system is just being represented and, um, you know, I'm an American citizen just like everybody else and I have a right to say whatever I need to say to get my voice across. Bernie didn't want to die. So Bernie must be dead right now? Or? No, no, he conceded because the Clintons, he didn't want the Clintons to kill him. All right, that sounds, that sounds, uh... That that sounds feasible. I, I don't I don't know if there's any proof of that, but I'm not saying it's not possible. You delegates or are you actors? What, what's the first step we could take to take money out of politics? How do we do that? How do we take uh, money out of politics? Yeah, just uh, taking the cue from her shirt. Well, I think that uh, democracy vouchers, Lawrence Lessig came up with the idea, democracy vouchers would help if you gave people a subsidized amount of money. They're down here screaming about no plan and no, like, break the system. Like, you can't break the system, that's anarchy. Like, that's just a basic premise of political science. Like, nobody here in the place, at this place wants anarchy. Like, we can't, you, the anarchy is not good for us, but like, you know, well, an anarchy just means that there are no rulers. It doesn't mean that there's chaos. There's no rules. It means there's no rules. You want to live in a world with no rules? Probably that sounds like a cool thing, but really, a world with no rules is pretty. The purge. Well, yeah. I think I think that right. I think that right now. I think right now that we don't have the maturity to live in a world with no, no rules. We're, not. we're like children. We have to have phones and we have to have calculus. People can't add two plus two anymore. We really need to just break down and learn how to have a conversation with each other. Like, genuinely talk. You can get angry, you can yell, you can throw things if you want, but you don't have to harm someone else in the matter to do it. Because killing someone or putting someone down or stopping them from hurting themselves isn't going to fix the problem. Their environment that they came from is still there. Everyone is just a product of their environment. Stop the starving and stop the wars and stuff. That's why everybody's here and it all comes down to Joe Stein's platform and that's what the Green Party's all about. So, um, so... 
uh, Hillary's not there to stop the wars. Trump's not there to stop the wars. No, dude, they're totally uh, uh, corrupt. I think right now, American democracy needs to pick, take a stool and sit down and listen. Listen to its people because right, it hasn't been listening and they're speaking to it right now. How do you, uh, uh, how do you engage someone like that? Do you just ignore her and find somebody else? Or like, how, how do you uh, create change when someone who's going for the presidency is pretty much adamant about not listening to you? Yeah, I mean, that's why I made this sign. You know, it's the fourth quarter and the DNC just kicked it wide, right? I mean, to, to use the football analogy, like, I, it's kind of unbelievable to me that when um, your opponent in the primaries wins 46% of the vote, not to mention, I think, something like 80% of the youth, you know, under 45 vote across the entire country, um, that you wouldn't then bring him in to your, your nomination. Bernie and Jill sitting in a tree. D E M E X I T. Dem exit. Dem exit. All right. When I was in the DNC, I was interviewing people in the DNC at Wells Fargo earlier today, and pretty much everyone that I was talking to pretty much said, just lay down, just accept it, roll over. Hillary's the nominee. She's the best uh, option that we have. According to the emails, Google's helping her cheat. She, uh, DNC, kind of stealing the uh, nomination from Bernie. I mean, what, what do you think about all? I mean, it's right all, all out there. Well, the, you know, the, the, the Wasserman Schultz situation was not really Hillary Clinton's fault. I don't think that she actually knew anything about it. I don't think that that falls in her lap. Um, that said, you know, everyone deserves a fair chance to run for office. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Bernie laying, in, laying down without a fight? Bernie didn't lay down. I mean, it's all about. Either we unite or we die. The emails basically uh, catch a red-handed DNC rigging the election against Bernie. It did, but what other choice do we have? Freedom is a very dangerous thing for so many different reasons, one of them being that you can take it for granted. You start becoming very, very lazy in your thought, in your speech, in your behavior, because now you don't even realize how, how blessed you are to live in a country where you can openly protest and not be killed by law. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. Talk about a direct assault on free speech and the First Amendment. University of Texas student Rohini Sethi made a post. Now, she's vice president of her student government association. She posted something regarding Black Lives Matter, which got her suspended from SGA, and she's also been ordered into a diversity workshop. Now, on July the 7th, following the Dallas shooting uh, that killed five officers, Sethi posted this. She said, forget Black Lives Matter, more like All Lives Matter. Now, the statement was later deleted, but after numerous students denounced that as incredibly offensive, even hate speech, she's been ordered to be suspended for 50 days following that simple comment, more like all lives matter. This is what one student had to say, just for her to say, forget Black Lives Matter is a punch in the stomach. Now, the SGA has sanctioned her and they, they attached a letter to this sanction. They say, the letter and the attached sanctions are in response to Rohini Sethi's social media comments and her subsequent actions and statements. It's fair to point out that one ignorant social media post alone may not warrant such, such sanctions. However, serving in the public role, uh, she's held to a higher standard. So apparently posting that all lives matter in the wake of a shooting that killed five officers will get you sanctioned from school. Now, talking about part of her punishment, this is what it includes. A 50-day suspension from student government starting today, August 1. She's required to attend three-day diversity workshops this month. She's required to attend three university cultural events She's been ordered to write a letter of reflection over how harmful her actions were, and she's finally been ordered to give a public presentation detailing the knowledge that she gained over cultural issues facing society. Now, no word yet on if she's stepping down or fighting back. The story just broke on the Daily Caller. It's been picked up by local media, but Black Lives Matter has been very silent about it. Now, meanwhile, they're allowed to burn down buildings, riot, wreak havoc and no reflection letter is needed on their part at all about their actions but this upstanding vice president of SGA honor roll student has been basically kicked out and forced into diversity training all because she posted a simple comment 
that all lives matter. Now, the university released a statement regarding her rights of free speech. And specifically, they say that although UH is a public university, free speech considerations did not factor into her punishment. And I'm directly quoting here, the First Amendment prevents a person from being jailed by the government for what they say, but it does not prevent people from receiving other consequences for what they say. So apparently, free speech only applies to Black Lives Matter, anybody speaking out against these cop killings, anybody who dares to say that all lives matter, they're censored, they're thrown out, and they're forced into diversity classes. Oh, and also they have to release a statement about their harmful actions and how they've learned from them. I'm Margaret Howell reporting for InfoWars.com. Jakari Jackson reporting for InfoWars.com. We're here at the University of Texas to talk to the students about campus carry. Campus carry meaning that if you're of age and you have the proper certificate, you can carry your pistol concealed on campus. Conversely, the University of Texas does not allow students to carry pepper spray on campus. So this has generated a whole lot of controversy and we're going to get the opinions from the students themselves. How you doing, sir? Univers University of Texas student? Uh, yeah. What do you think about campus carry? Uh, personally, um, I don't see too much of a problem with it. Um, I think I, I grew up in San Antonio, so kind of the south, um, and I think as long as they're responsible, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I don't really agree with it. It's not my school. I'm not in a position to make decisions for their campus culture. Um, I'm glad that we chose to waive it at Rice. That's yeah. really... Agreed. Also, here at the University of Texas, they don't allow students to carry things as simple as pepper spray. Would you be in favor of students being able to carry pepper spray? I mean, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I, I don't really know. Um, I guess it depends because I don't really know how safe campus is here. I don't really have any thoughts on it. I don't own a gun or anything, so I don't know. So kind of indifferent? Yeah, I guess. Oh, it's ridiculous. No, that should not happen. What, are the, what do people think? Okay, so let's, let me give you a scenario. Okay, let's say a young lady's out at night and maybe she encounters somebody on the University of Texas campus. What do you think she should do to defend herself? Kick him in the nuts. Many schools around the nation, uh, college campuses, don't even allow kids to carry things like tasers or pepper spray. In lieu of campus carry, would you be in favor of students carrying pepper spray in their purses? They're not allowed to carry pepper spray since when? I think it's a little bit of a shame that we've managed to twist the logic of violence into um, more weapons that perpetrate violence are necessary to stop violence because as we've seen time and time again that's not true. Uh, with all the laws that are coming into place, like in Texas for instance, open carry, ostensibly that means you carry a weapon with you openly so that when situations get hairy, um, you know, you can you can defend yourself, but as we saw with Baton Rouge and with Dallas, whenever there were uh, like police shootings, uh, the second things started getting hairy, people started turning their weapons into the police, open carry weapons. So, I mean, if you're going to open carry a weapon, but you're going to turn it back in whenever the going gets tough, like what's the point of having? No, the police said that he was a suspect. That's why the man turned in his weapon. In Dallas. Well, what, what I'm saying is not only that, but the police stations themselves in Baton Rouge and in Dallas have put out statements saying, please do not open carry weapons in tense situations like this because it makes it very hard to determine who the bad guy is and who the good guy is. We've seen multiple mass shootings going on around the country where people who didn't obey the gun-free zone sign, for example, uh, Virginia Tech, Columbine, on and on and on. Uh, in I guess like the counter argument is that maybe if a teacher or somebody had a firearm at the time, maybe something could have been done to help before uh, things got as bad as they were. Well, of course, you could throw ifs around in, in so many different situations, but I mean, look at Orlando. You had armed security guards at that, um, you had trained armed security guards at the Pulse nightclub. The point I'm saying is even if people don't have a firearm, they'll use whatever weapon they have available to them to commit said crime, just like the Japanese man who stabbed 19 people in the medical facility last week. Imagine if the Japanese guy had an automatic weapon. Imagine if the Japanese guy had an automatic weapon. You could throw ifs around in, in so many different situations because what you, we need the ATF for is to regulate the illegal gun trade. And the, and the NRA needs the illegal gun trade to stay alive so that they can use the anybody can get a gun because there's a black market for guns argument in everything. Is that not true? It is true that there is a black market, absolutely. But what the NRA have actually done is defund, via Congress, they have defunded the one, uh, it's the Tiered Amendment, look it up, the, it's the one uh, 
governmental organization tasked with regulating the illegal gun trade. Now, I'm not saying that if you throw a bunch of money at the ATF, that all of a sudden the illegal gun trade is going to go away. That will probably never happen. But we can make incredible efforts to stop it and stop its expansion and make sure we know what guns we're dealing with on the streets if people like the NRA didn't defund these people. Among many other things, the ATF has given guns to Mexican drug cartels. Great. So have so many people. I don't know what you're trying to tell me with that. Well, the point I'm making is why would you want to fund, why would you fund an organization that gives guns to people like El Chapo? It's been on CBS News. Okay. Um, well, the point is, is... I mean, you're saying to get the bad guns off the street, get the hands off the guns of the bad people, but you have an organization who we know gave guns to Mexican drug cartels, and they killed people with those guns. What so I, why would you want to fund an organization like I'm that? Saying, I'm not saying that the ATF is the greatest organization on the planet. You don't go into Walmart and buy a suicide bomb. You don't go into Walmart and buy a truck specifically designed to, to drive through crowds of people. But an AR-15, let's be real, that's not made to shoot a deer. That's not made to... I disagree with that. You can shoot a deer with an AR-15. You can, but <laughs> they didn't... You, you can shoot a deer with an AR-15. Okay, so they made a rifle. Let's take an M1. You could shoot a deer with an M1, whatever. No one was like, you know what? I need an easier way to kill this deer. Please make me an AR-15. No, that was adapted for military style, which was military style weapons are only made to kill people. I agree it was a military gun, but it was adapted to a civilian purpose, and with that civilian gun, you can shoot a deer, whether it's an AR-15, an AK-47, any number of other guns. Right. What I'm saying is that if you can walk into Walmart and find things that were purposed for mass murder, mm -hmm. and that's what bothers me, is that that seems to be such a high value in our society. Well, I guess it scares me more that you can use something that's not made as a weapon like a truck and kill or hit 200 people, kill 84 of them. Once again, it wasn't made for the purpose of killing or maiming people. Whole different, that's a whole different conversation, because if you want to talk about motives and you want to talk about, like, what... Um, no, is, I wasn't even talking about motives. I was talking about the tool they used. Well, right, but the tool wouldn't have been used had countries like France and Belgium known uh, how to take care of their own citizens. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, welcome back. Now, Margaret Howell and I have taken to the studio. We are here with some advice for Donald Trump. Have you learned nothing from the DNC leaks? The Democrats have <laughs> weaponized reporters. They're armed with questions specifically to trigger you. Prove your merit and stop falling for the traps. So now we know that the left runs on feelings over facts. They are, this is their whole campaign. They don't want to run on their record. They want to tear down their opponents. You know, they're not really worried about educating their voters. They just want to divert and, and divide everyone, get them all kind of riled up about non-issues. So of course, they're going to be using these diversion tactics well into November. They're not going to tackle any real issues. So Donald, please stop allowing reporters to divert America from the real issues. Instead, pivot back around to what Hillary Clinton does not want to talk about. Well, Leanne, he should be calling you for advice. I mean, the communications do. director, seriously, who, whomever <laughs> is running this, you know, he, he runs on high emotion, which is part of his appeal. People like how real he is, but at the same time, he's got to start scaling back, especially the tweets when he's engaging in the tit for tat. Nobody's appreciating that very much. And hunkering down, speaking of real issues and those leaks, uh, Julian Assange today, he said that within Hillary Clinton's emails, specifically regarding those leaks, uh, that she was absolutely no question about it, supplying weapons to jihadis in Syria. Uh, he goes on to say that there was a weapons flow going into Syria being pushed by Hillary Clinton uh, to jihadis, including ISIS. So she was arming ISIS as Secretary of State. That's what these emails suggest. Uh, 1,700 of them in, in, this, in this specific collection. They've released the ones from Libya alone. And it's explosive. You talk about a real issue right there. And then she was questioned in 2013, and she said, I have no knowledge of any weapons before Congress. Right. That's a real issue, Donald. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's just, she doesn't want people to talk about that. She doesn't want people to talk about the Clinton Foundation. And then, of course, they roll out their new pet project here uh, with Mr. Kazir Khan. Okay, so he is attacking Donald Trump. One of the first things he says is, you know, Donald Trump, how dare you? You've made no sacrifices. I've sacrificed. First of all, you know, his son, like all soldiers, go and volunteer 
for that service, all right? So he did not make that personal sacrifice. But why is Donald Trump being singled out here? Has Obama made a personal sacrifice for <laughs> Hillary Clinton? No, and in fact, why is he up on the stage there when it was Hillary Clinton who was one of the people who voted for the Iraq war and mm -hmm. continued to support it up until 2014? It's so that's this, this useless war, unjust war that, you know, you had to sacrifice your son. Um, but now, you know, obviously we know the Clinton campaign is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on opposition research for Donald Trump because that's what they do. They want to take out their opponent. Trump needs to be doing the exact same thing, getting into the ties with this man's Muslim Brotherhood. Thankfully, we do have some respectable people out there in the media who are that tapping are doing the into work. this. Yeah. You know, so take a look at these articles before you just lash out. You know, give it a while because you do have people on your side. Breitbart is pointing out um, the, the, about Kazir Khan's deep legal and financial connections to Saudi Arabia. Of course, the ties with his law firm um, and the Clinton Foundation. They're... Uh, is an, it's an international Islamist investors group through his own law firm where they're basically uh, selling these immigration programs to wealthy foreigners so they can essentially buy their way into the U.S. Of course, many countries have this, but America is considered kind of the Walmart of these buy-in programs because I think it's only like $500,000. Right. You can buy your citizenship. And so he specializes in that uh, for the Arab community. They're, uh, like I said, deep ties to the government of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And then in The American Thinker, they go on to talk about the backstory with Kazir Khan. Uh, get into this as well. This was uh, out of the Shubat website. And um, they're talking about Khan being a promoter of Islamic Sharia law. He's a co-founder of the Journal of Contemporary Issues in Muslim Law. He has shown his appreciation for an icon of the Muslim Brotherhood, Saeed Ra uh, Ramadan, who, of course, is the son-in-law of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, a.k.a. Huma Abedin's boss. Oh, my. Yeah, so, I mean, it goes really deep. And, you know, get also his website, um, there was a reporter who was calling the number to his law office, and they said, well, this is not that Kazir Khan, but it's also the phone number of a group called American Muslims Vote. Uh, they want to create an enlightened community of uh, patriotic American Muslims, encouraging them to participate in the democratic process, local, state, and national level. And this domain was registered by Kazir Khan in, uh, on July 23rd of 2016. So all of his um, platitudes there on stage were about his business, mm -hmm. okay? And it's just, you know, throwing Trump under the bus, but he had nothing to do with it. You think that she would have picked a, a, somebody with less um, controversy, just doing basic journalistic work, which Breitbart did, you know, finding out who this guy is. And not only that, but uh, Huma's connections mm -hmm. to radical e extremists. And it's just remarkable. You know, I would have picked a better candidate. And it was bizarre how he was engaging Trump back and forth personally. It's weird to see Trump constantly take the bait, just take right. Get back to that, you know, getting past that and doing this basic research, as you pointed out, we could take this discussion to the next level. Right. And we have to continually point out their hypocrisy, but it gets exhausting because there's so much of it. Perfect example, uh, the Maddow blog tweeted out a week ago or a week and a half ago uh, how terrible it was for the RNC to exploit the pain of a grieving mother for partisan gain. Cindy <laughs> Sheehan, of course, was there on the opening day of the RNC. Right. A week later, they talk about how Kasir Khan's speech will not be forgotten. Right. Hello. So it's okay to use, the, the exploit the feelings of a grieving parent for partisan right. gain if it's on the right side. Right. But so if they're totally pushing, hypocritical. They're pushing Hillary Clinton belongs in stripes, which is exactly what Pat, I believe her name is Pat Smith. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Is that yes. right? Uh, Sean Smith's mother. He died in that Benghazi attack. And uh, she said Hillary belongs in stripes. And she was very poignant about that, that she holds Hillary Clinton responsible for the death of her son. So we can't highlight those cases when people are actually, you know, they understand who's responsible for something. We can only highlight the fact if somebody's a Muslim, we've got to put them center stage because that's the only thing that matters in this fight. Right, because that's the weaponized thing or just diverting, divide and conquer. That's what so many people, you know, they're twisting Donald Trump's words once mm -hmm. again. I feel like he needs to just pin his exact <laughs> words to the top of his Twitter profile right. so they can stop being spun out of uh, context. But then, of course, there's a whole Russia thing. You know, pivot back to the fact that Hillary Clinton 
uh, during her tenure as Secretary of State, okayed the sale of about 20% of the U.S. uranium stockpile to the Russian government. Wall Street Journal today is pointing about uh, reporting about the Clinton Foundation and their ties uh, to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So why did Hillary's State Department urge U.S. investors to fund Russian research for military uses? So basically, during her tenure as uh, Secretary of State, she is getting all of these uh, U.S. investors. It's basically the Silicon Valley of Russia, and they're using it for military technology. So it's She's selling let's uranium. Let's talk about that, <laughs> those ties. It goes above Seriously. and beyond. And then, of course, there is the hypocritical progressive media now talking about Melania Trump's nude photo scandal. You know, the, the, do you remember the boobs for Bernie movement where pe women were taking off their bras in mass, um, showing their breasts in public? You know, a, bra, a, a boob is not supposed to be sexualized. Excuse me, a breast is not supposed to be sexualized. <laughs> There's nothing sexual about it. We're people too. This entire yeah, movement. free the nipple. Free the nipple. But I mean, that was like, uh, Miley Cyrus was so amazing with right. her free the nipple campaign. I thought Melania looked beautiful, just on a side note. I mean, who cares? You know, that again, the hypocrisy of this the right. hypocrisy well uh, first of all this is the this is the media who's trying to just hammer it in the, our heads that there's this rape culture mm -hmm. yet they refuse to talk about bill clinton being a serial predator so you want to talk about melania's tasteful nudes that she did back when she was a model as an adult you refuse not. to to cover bill clinton and the myriad of women the trail of bill's bimbos mm -hmm. that hillary clinton of course viciously uh, psychologically abused. These women said that they wanted to kill themselves. I mean, Huma Abedin's husband has Talk nudes about a floating serial out. philandering womanizing. Obama's mom. Oh my gosh. Has nudes out there. I mean, do you want to go there? Like, th so this is what I just don't understand. They won't recover that because how dare you go there? But right. then they're going to be like, ooh, this is going to be the first lady. It's Carlos so Danger is off limits, but something that someone did as an adult. Exactly. <laughs> Who's apparently pushing a documentary, which I think 300 people have actually seen. It's, it's really bizarre. But that just goes to show you, you know, Hillary's personality of the attack dog. It's weird that, uh, you know, her, her personal top aide would also be in bed with a philanderer that she has to then protect. It's very strange on a, right. on a different note. That's, that's well, she probably really got some bizarre. coaching from Hillary on that. And of course, we can point out the hypocritical, hypocritical uh, theories there where they're constantly asking Ivanka, how did your father treat women? Mm -hmm. But they're never asking the same question of Chelsea, right. because we all know how her dad treats women. Right. So there you go. It's tough fighting back against this all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to the show this evening. We will continue fighting the info war here, and we will see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.